This is the Unearthing Art Podcast with Michelle Luminato and Beck Lee, where we dig into the messy reality of making art that matters, raw and real conversations about being an artist, navigating the creative process, and expressing our honest and sometimes weird selves. Today, Michelle, we thought we could have just a bit more of a casual conversation. We're not 100% sure where this is headed, but there are some things that we've been talking about over the course of the podcast that I think might be worth just slowing down a little bit on. Things that we talk about that we might assume everyone thinks the same way we do. In fact, we we often find that between ourselves, don't we? I'm assuming you, you're assuming I know what you're talking about and I'm assuming you know what I'm talking about. Definitely. And we discover a whole new thing. (laughs) One of those things was when we were talking in the last episode about kind of reviewing my art journal, which is a yep. collection of images and ideas and writing that I've been just sort of documenting my process over the last 18 months. And we were talking about going through that and how we can both see in that the growth or the change between where I was when I first came into what is now Origin Art with you and where I am now. And we talked about how in those early days, the ideas and studies that I was exploring were limited but I'd already kind of defined in my mind that my art was going to be about and then I would it's sort of called confirmation bias I would look for stuff that would confirm that idea and I was only exploring within that kind of narrowed down path Mm -hmm. rather than what we do in origin art which is really opening up and digging in I think a lot more to your your strengths and the sources that you have within you and discovering new things about yourself. I think that's really important. Yeah, leveraging strengths that you already have as well. Our own strengths, you know, we underestimate often. We kind of take for granted. We kind of glaze over those as really not always necessarily important pieces that might be valuable in a form of expression or using that as a creative and as a creative entrepreneur as well. So I think it's, Mm. yeah, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pieces to the digging, definitely. And when you first came in, you definitely, what I saw anyways, was there was pieces of you that I couldn't see that I knew were there. Because I think we often think that if we exclude things, and we don't let all these sides of ourselves come out, and we don't really look at that, that that's really what is going to be a better solution for art because you can go far making art that is to some degree that is people pleasing or or not fully expressing yourself and I guess because what I was hoping we could do today was to get even more specific and really slow down on what we mean by that probably we would say and I'm going to you can say yes or no to this. We would say that we feel that great art, that impactful art, and that's um, visual art, writing, song, dance, whatever it is, um, reveals something about the creator. Mm -hmm. Let's take that as a very like, simple line. Would you agree with that? I Not only do I agree with that, but I'm like, yeah, <laughs> that's that's it. It is yeah. about revealing something of the creator. If you, And I love that if you think of all the great musicians and all the great songs that you've heard, you know, it's something about them that's coming through the actual piece. Just taking that as a baseline, that really great art, whatever the form, shows something of the creator is uh, I don't think necessarily this is what's interesting you and I can kind of take that as a given I don't think necessarily every artist you talk to everyone who's practicing art in the various forms might immediately agree with that Mm -hmm. Um, or maybe hasn't thought about it let's put it like that who hasn't really thought oh I've got to put something of myself on the line and I think it's exactly like you were saying before when you were looking at Um, what I was showing you when we first met in terms of what I was working on, what I was painting. And you're thinking, well, I don't know Beck. um, And I feel like there might be some more there because you were talking to me and and knowing me as a person. And you're like, 
uh, there's some it, missing pieces. Something's not quite fully there. Mm-hmm. And I think that's if if I had been more fully expressed in what I was working on, I think you would have had more of a sense of who I was just by looking at those images. Yes. But you didn't because yes. I wasn't. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Those are sometimes things that we're, you know, not thinking again is palatable, you know, in, in terms of where mm-hmm. we're at in our journey because we don't really feel like either we're not ready to show that side, you know, to the people who were viewing our painters or we're not ready to go through that as an artist because we really, we live our art, right? Like if we say that, you know, the art really shows something Mm -hmm. of the creator, sometimes we have to actually be comfortable with what it takes to do that as well. That's a big thing that we have to be comfortable with because some of what you're talking about there is kind of about making a choice, Mm -hmm. like uh, not being ready to show something. But I think... Because you could have asked me these questions at that time. I was not even aware that there was more that I could be doing to express more of myself, if that Mm -hmm. makes sense. And it sounds, even as I say that out loud, I'm kind of, I can't believe that in myself. (laughs) How could I not know that? But it's like when you have a certain... um, you know, when you're working in the studio, when you're making paintings and when you're thinking a lot about technical things, you know, composition, you're thinking about colours, you're thinking about space and you may have thought a little bit about what you're working on means to you. You can have had, like I was, I had made connections at that time with um, a period of ill health and I was making a connection with how I found nature very nurturing and nourishing so I felt like that was my theme Mm -hmm. right in a broad sense Mm -hmm. what I know now is that there is a a deeper and potentially more demanding process we talked about last week about not realizing when I was signing up to be an artist and a painter that I was signing up to just be riding these waves of identity shifts like this (laughs) flux in identity and that's because if you're doing this deep work you're learning about yourself and then bringing that to the surface to bring out in your art and you know Michelle when I talk like this and I feel like this is what I feel is very important to myself in the artist journey like to me this is what it's all about but I kind of wonder you know is this what other artists think it's all about are there other artists just happily say, no, I don't need to, I don't need to dig into any murky <laughs> yeah. depths. I don't, you know, need to get yeah. down and get to, I don't know what, if you want to do that, Beck, that's great. Yeah. But, um, yeah. I, I think there's a lot of artists who probably don't think like this. I've, I've actually feel like I've done both, um, in the sense of mm-hmm. kind of pursued that part where there wasn't really the deeper side of myself. Uh, I even took that to market, you know, and, and sold from that perspective. And I guess that's why I do feel so passionate about it, because I found for myself, me stripping away things, which again, when we're stripping away things, you know, and kind of what I consider more like holding back, you know, it's like us holding back on the podcast, if we kind of did like the contained version of the Beck and Michelle show, you know, like, what would it look like? Yeah, you know, you wouldn't hear dogs in the background, you wouldn't like, there's a lot of things that would probably be different, <laughs> you know, for me, we probably have a plan at the beginning, of we'd each have an exact plan, and, we wouldn't you know. ramble, we wouldn't make mistakes, <laughs> like we'd be super tightly edited. But I think what I found from me, kind of holding myself back was I felt like I was suffocating. I felt like there was this part of me that wasn't able to breathe freely, that I couldn't feel good in my own skin, you know, that there was almost like this facade Mm -hmm. that I was living that really tore me apart in some ways. I know that sounds a bit dramatic, but Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel like I was Mm -hmm. in integrity with myself. And for me, I really sucked at acting class. You know, I know this doesn't have anything to do with the the yeah. acting, but I just, I was not the kid who could act well. I could not pretend well. I'm not good at pretending. So for me, 
I just wasn't yeah. good at doing it any other way. And so when I really started saying, actually, let me think about what I actually care about. What what would feel good? You know, me being myself, me letting out more of my authentic self, it just felt like I could breathe a little bit. I felt like it was less of mm -hmm. a contained bubble, you know, and yeah. I think one of the things about the contained bubble is, you know, sometimes, and I'm just using myself as an example here because I do feel I've lived both worlds. And yeah. I think that the contained bubble feels safer, you know, from a glance. Like, it's like, that's the way you're going to get everything you want. You know, it's all going to be in this nicely contained bubble that you think you're controlling, you know, and you're molding. But I think it's manageable, but I think it really kind of can unravel because it, it there's nothing you can really control. I mean, I think that's an illusion. Like, I think that the bubble, it, it, for me, it was a bit of an illusion of what I thought was the acceptable version. Does that make any sense? That was a bit of a ramble on a tangent there. I think it does. I. I think it sounds a bit also like a, just a slightly different perspective of that is the idea that by being um, unobjectionable, that no one's going to kind of notice or make any negative comments. Like you're going to slide under the radar because you're in your right, bubble right. and you're doing this very, very uh, non-offensive thing. But the truth, the truth is there's always people who are offended by just your yes. existence, honestly. <laughs> yes. um, and you're absolutely right that it does, it takes energy to maintain. So mm -hmm. whatever um, path you're doing, whatever, how you're like maintaining this bubble, whatever kind of work you're doing at work, you can think, I'm not going to get down into the sludgy, I'm not going to, um, you know, do get into this really oh, emotionally taxing stuff. But actually it takes a lot of energy to maintain this bright and happy exterior, I if you want to think, think of it that way. It takes yeah. to, to keep that other stuff pushed down, to, yeah. to not notice it, yeah, um, to resist because it's in a kind of resistance. And I think now, having just said moments ago that – Back when we were first talking about this 18 months ago, I wasn't aware of anything deeper. Like I wouldn't have said, oh, there isn't anything else to worry about. I'm not sure that's actually true now that I say, <laughs> now that I think about it, because there were conversations we were starting to have. And I would say that some part of me, probably that part that was being tucked away a little bit, was there and was just on the brink of kind of coming and expressing itself a bit more and you were prodding at that and I was shutting it down. I was saying, no, no, I can't handle, yep. I can't handle thinking about more bold shapes and, and I can't handle thinking about introducing more dark colours and I can't handle thinking about how my writing might, you know, come in and interact with all of this. And I, I can't handle thinking about these other themes, which I find really fascinating, which I read, which in my reading, you know, on my bookshelf, I've got these other themes and kind of ideas, but I just, I can't handle all that. I want to keep this nice manageable bubble of painting in this way and just a single idea because that's doable. And I think people will like that. And I just want to keep to that. So the other stuff was there, but I was kind of thinking it was more manageable, like you said, to continue on the way that I was doing. And I think same, going back to what I was saying before about um, sometimes I wonder if kind of pushing this line and, and sharing these kind of conversations, I, I genuinely worry at times how helpful that is to people. Like maybe not everyone, like I said, wants to go down this path but I think what's interesting about that is that although people might not be sure or they might be listening to this going what the, the hell is Beck and Michelle <laughs> talking about the thing is that people come to you particularly Michelle as you know as a someone who works with artists with the symptoms 
Mm-hmm. It's, you know, like they may not be aware of what the um, cause is, but they have the symptoms like I did of frustration, of feeling uneasy with what they're doing in some way, but unable to put their finger on what it is that they're unhappy with about their work, feeling very, um, you know, up and down about their art, as in some days they're excited and they're like, yay, I'm I'm on the path, I want to be an artist and I'm ready to go back into the studio. And then other days just really deflated and like, I have no idea what I'm doing here. I, I started, you know, this painting yesterday and like, where am I going with this? And so there are symptoms there that we think, that we both believe can be, once you start to explore that, this is what comes up. It's exploring what's inside. And I will say that um, I have, and now getting to see artists in Origin Art, who, when they have these kind of breakthroughs, when they start to go, when they have that little, tr- that transition, it's not a little transition, when they have that experience like what I had when they go from going no no this is what I do this is the box these are the colors these are the themes these are the ideas and they have that moment of oh suddenly I understand what's available here actually I can choose from a lot wider range of things and I can have this source within myself and it's all coming out and it's all coming together and it's actually it's not scary it's not scary because suddenly that feeling of up and down and frustration and feeling confused it's it's like a whole new world of excitement about what's possible in their work and how they can spend their days in the studio in a way that yeah, it, it can be more demanding, but when you're in alignment, it's actually less energy to it. And so that's mm-hmm. what makes me <laughs> keep, it's, keep on having these conversations. Yeah, and I think I think you're spot on about the energy. I think it at first glance, it feels like, oh, I, I don't know, I can't really go down that path because it takes, it feels like it takes more work. But to ignore it, I've, personally feel like it takes way more work it takes way more work to Mm -hmm. have those highs and lows and things that you're like oh that's not it and you know this unsettling feeling and chasing these things that are outside of yourself there's there's a lot of energy around that I'm saying that from my own experience like yeah where I've shared with artists who've listened to me even in the in the membership and even through the artist breakthrough blueprint there was shame for me and feeling that I looked at a painting and I couldn't be proud of it. And I couldn't Mm -hmm. always identify why I couldn't be proud of it. I couldn't yet really say, is it because, you know, it's a terrible composition or is there more than that? You know, and for me, it was more than that. And again, it was that energy that I didn't realize how time sucking that was. So what I found is that we tend to think, okay, if I'm more, you know, in this bubble, that's palatable, you know, that's more agreeable to more people. That might be true, but there's so much work to find those more people like it requires volume. And I don't want to derail this conversation. But there's a trade off for that. The other trade off with that is that I get to spend more time on my art I don't need to find as many people, you know, in terms of, you know, making it more mass appeal. I can do something that really goes into maybe something more specific, but it's not everyone's going to get it. Not everyone's going to like it, but that's okay. It doesn't really matter because I'm not looking for volumes of people. I'm, you know, looking for people who want what I want, you know, which is to see things this way. You know what I mean? I Love what you said there about, I think, spot on about in the studio, really in connection with yourself and and accepting this idea and, and really running with this idea that really great art is a reflection of your own uniqueness actually really does make things easier because what you describe of looking at paintings and not being sure, is this good? Is this not good? Is it the composition? And, and kind of 
relying on trying to analyze with a lot of those mechanical techniques. I wonder whether that's the challenge and the difficulty that comes with trying to create a theor- a piece of art that's based on some kind of theoretical standard, as in you're trying to create something that you think a lot of people will like. So you don't have any measurements within yourself. So when you go to check something against, okay, does this feel like, um, how do I feel about this piece of art? Uh, is it at the right place? Is it is it finished? It's not your own internal, I don't know, barometer or thermometer mm-hmm. <laughs> that you're checking against because you've set out to create something that's quite external and so you can only analyse it from that kind of distanced way. But if you're creating art that's very connected with your own gut and heart and instincts and from yourself, then you can tell a lot more easily, does this meet my sense of, yes. of is it in the right place? Is, yes. it, is it ticking all the boxes for me? So like number one, it actually makes the studio easier in that sense because yeah. of the way you described, you know, standing in front of the painting going, is this done? Is it the composition? Is it this or that? When you shift your criteria to your own uniqueness, then the questions become a lot more, they're much more interesting for starters, I'd say. Like not necessarily, it's not that it's easier, but it is is something that you have the resources to answer, let's say. That's what what you were saying. And and you can learn to trust yourself as opposed to, uh, you know, dare I say again, I've said this several times, but I used to go to my husband, my kids, the dog, do you, is it good? Is it done? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) You know, and I don't, I don't have to do that anymore. And it's just because if you can learn to trust yourself, but, you know, really step into what that looks like, you do have the answers, you know, yeah, you know, you, you know, really do. what that feeling is that you're going after. And if it's capturing it, it may not be perfect. I still don't believe I make perfect paintings, but it's, it's in the direction, you know, that I can be satisfied with and, and then work on another one that aspires to maybe get a little bit closer to it, if that makes sense. Mm. And there's something I want to be a bit more explicit about here because you just talked about then, you were talking about when we, you know, find our people, when we find our collectors and our audience and that if we're making more, if we're going for a more mainstream audience, meaning Mm -hmm. a large number of people that we might then be tempted to kind of water down our art and have art that has what we think is a more broad appeal and that has its own set of challenges in terms of, marketing and how you find that people and how you stand out in the marketplace versus when you have art that's more unique um, and from yourself and I just wondered if we can be can we be more specific Michelle in kind of explaining the difference between what we mean by making art that has more of a mainstream appeal versus art that's more drawn from our own strengths and our own uniqueness because I know you were talking about if you were setting out and saying okay I'm looking at the market what do I think is going to do well you might think that there's you know like seven or eight different offerings out there like there's florals there's landscapes seascapes portraits abstract you know so let, let me choose one of those and then (laughs) <laughs> start painting that's it and I think if you think of it that simple you know as in like there's just six buckets of art mm. that's where you kind of think well flowers should look like this or landscape should look like this this is what seems to be the common you know thread of what I'm seeing out in the world and I think this is where um as artists, we can get lost in the market a little bit because mm. there's people who look very similar. There's people, um, well, there's artists who maybe have the same ideas of, yeah, I'm looking to do landscapes and this seems to be popular. But the thing that I see happen is that usually the artists are, are following each other. And so mm-hmm. the market then uses that as a 
uh, a leverage against the artist. I know that sounds really kind of, I don't know if that sounds bad, but the reality is the buyers, the collectors have a little more buying power because then they say, well, there's about, you know, 10 paintings that are 10 painters who do landscapes. I'm looking for a landscape. Uh, look at all these these 10 painters. They've got blue skies. They've got this. And there's some similarities to those paintings. Mm. And so mm -hmm. then what they're really looking at is how can I get the best deal when there's that much going on? So the, the trade-off for what I consider more of a mass appeal, and again, if you think of stores like Kmart or Target, where they're really going after volume, they're a really good example. If you walk in there and you look at what kind of art are they selling, they're definitely doing what I call more watered down mass appeal. Like they're trying to appeal to mm -hmm. hundreds of thousands of people. They also mm -hmm. can reach those hundreds of thousands of people. And so their prices are chopped for that reason. When I say watered down, or um, it, it's kind of basically making choices that you think the most amount of people will like. And even though it might seem like, well, my art will appeal to more people, I believe, and again, this is just my opinion based on my personal experience of trying it all different ways, I think it's harder because the goal then with that is that you're really trying to find all those people. So the energy yeah. in that art, not only are you kind of looking outside of yourself for those solutions, because you've got to water it down to the most common denominators um, mm -hmm. for that, you're then kind of putting energy into finding more people because mm -hmm. the market doesn't necessarily pay higher value for that. It pays less value for that. And so buyers tend to be more price shopping. For example, in my open studio one time, which was a huge turning point for me, I had a, a husband who was was brought to, you know, come and see this big painting. He haggled me. I think I've mentioned this on this podcast before, but he was literally trying to whack my prices down. I was really trying to hold my ground, you know, and really be firm. And I realized in that particular format and the kind of things that I was doing, there wasn't this specialty that I was bringing that I could stand by and say, oh, no, this is the price. And so I yeah. think you attract a different kind of collector um, in your art when you're doing those things. And that was where, for me, it was a pivotal point. And I was like, that's it. I'm not making art that's negotiable. I want to make art that has more value in it. I want to see the value as a creator in that, you know, something that's more mm. unique. And I want my collectors to see it so they don't haggle me for it because I don't really enjoy making art that people, you know, are looking for discounts and price cuts on because, you know, in the end, he got it for a really good deal. And I'm still a little bit like, <laughs> it's still damn really him. It. I can't believe that he got <laughs> me to do that. But, you know, it's a lesson. It's a story. So when you talk about watering down and kind of mainstream appeal, that might look like oh, you know, the trending colors this season mm -hmm. are, you know, more tonal or pastel or green, you whatever, so yeah. there are specific colors. It might be people are really liking um, florals in a simplified geometric mm -hmm. style. And so you get all these kind of puzzle pieces and then mm -hmm. you're like, well, it'll, it'll, make, it'll make it easier for me because I'll, I'll put together something that looks like that and it, and it and I can see similarities. So when you look at your art alongside you, I can see similarities. Um, and when we talk about this self-sourced uniqueness, um, you know, it might be that you've just got a hankering for neon orange. And that's <laughs> that's not the trend at the moment. So, yeah. you, well, you know, that's going to make, that's going to stick out. It's not going to look good. It's going to clash. So you don't explore that. But that's what we're talking about, creating something that sets your part and the funny thing about it is I think it looks very similar to something else that artists do which talk about finding their um, unique style or their unique artistic voice but mm -hmm. the funny thing about it is that when we're having conversations about that it's often again looking externally mm -hmm. as though you can look across the market and say you're right you're right Michelle I don't want to be watered down mainstream I don't want to have something that looks like what you could buy in Kmart so they're doing a lot of 
pastel geometric flowers so I want to do something different so then from an analytical point of view you're like well what's different what can I add that's different it can still be really difficult it can be a struggle I've been there like what what can I do that's different now you're kind of I don't know throwing everything in the casserole pot I feel like we've had (laughs) used that analogy many many (laughs) moons ago you know you start trying things out and we come back around to how hard it is as an artist then to assess your success at that to look at your work and make judgments and understand what's missing and not missing if if the framework that you've used is picking external oh what can make it different what this or that whereas what we're really (laughs) have experienced and are believing is that when instead of saying okay I need to find a voice that looks different from everything else in the market you start by you don't even don't even look at the market to start with like Mm -hmm. that's not where you should be starting where you should be starting is this how do I create something that when someone looks at it it's like they're seeing a piece of me on the canvas Mm -hmm. and also probably making peace with that idea Step one. I think step one is making peace. And I think one of the phrases that I was just thinking about, this phrase of finding your style, and it's like the phrase finding your style, like as if it's to be found somewhere outside of yourself. Mm. And I think Mm. that's really, you know, the the big punchline to that is it's not about finding your style as if you go and find it. It's actually unlocking it that's already in Mm. there, you know, it's unlocking those core pieces to yourself that allows the art to come out, you know, and be that expression of yourself. Again, if you believe in letting yourself be part of that self-expression, but again, look at the great musicians and the great other examples beyond painting who do this very well. And they definitely let this piece of them come out And Mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, the most successful things aren't mainstream. And, and I think that there's what's really ironic about this whole thing. And what I talked about in the artist breakthrough blueprint is that there's so much hustling that has to be done when we do it this other way, where we're, you know, making it more palatable, we're on the Instagram hustle. Again, I feel like we talk about Instagram every episode. And the more unique we can get, the more unique I personally have allowed myself to be and really live from that, the less hustle I'm doing, the less on Instagram I'm doing, the more people are coming to me and finding me. And I'm like, how are you even finding me? Because Mm. I think it's that thing where you become this light that attracts people rather than you going and saying, hey, look at me, look at me. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's a different kind of experience. Yep. And understanding that having that uniqueness isn't something that, (laughs) I was about to say it isn't something that's hard work. It isn't hard work in the sense that it's not something that you have to externally go and discover. It it takes work and there's a commitment to the path Mm -hmm. and a commitment to, you know, working through the, all the... (laughs) mindset stuff and the vulnerabilities that come from revealing yourself but the point is that it's not your uniqueness is not a special secret treasure that you have to go out out on a a hunt in the outside world to find it's something that you already have the work is in uncovering and expressing and having the bravery to express the uniqueness that you truly have and if you doubt that and if you you know sit there thinking uh, no, I don't know what that is all I can say is you really <laughs> have it it's just you've got to take the steps towards finding that in yourself and it'll be there it's totally there it's always there it's, and I say this with such com- Michelle will say it as confidence as someone who works with artists I say it with complete confidence as someone who worked with many you know business people, solo entrepreneur type people who had messages they want to share with the world and as a writer and who would come to me and say, I don't feel like I have a message that sounds unique enough and special enough for the world. Like, what is it about me? And now having worked with artists as well, like artists who say, oh, I'm not sure what it's about. 
it's totally there. It's t- it's just beneath the surface. Yeah. It's just there. And it's, right? it's it, it not only is it just there, but it's in plain sight. And I think that's mm-hmm. why it's so hard to find because we're so busy looking outside of ourselves and looking, totally. you know, in this exterior exterior world that we think has the solution. And it's in plain sight right in front of us. And I smile. You can't see me if you're listening to the podcast, but I smile because I'm like, it's so obvious to everyone around you as well like you'd be surprised (laughs) and when we get to what I love about um, working with artists I get so much joy from it because I literally get to see them see themselves in a way that they've never seen before and it's like oh there I am and I am as a person who gets to know people I'm like and how beautiful how divine you are you know like as yourself because you just sparkle like your own little star, you know, and you don't need to be like anyone else. So it's really cool. Yeah, I love what you're saying about it's there in plain sight. And I think that perhaps the reason why we don't see it is because we're looking for something that looks like what other people <laughs> yeah. have, which is completely the whole point. So we say, oh, it must look something like that. And then we look within ourselves, I can't see something like that. I can't see something like that particular style or that particular message that they have or that I can't find things like that in me, so I mustn't have it. It's because yours doesn't look like <laughs> anyone else's. It's like <laughs> the answer's in the problem. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. And I think we're laughing confidently because we have we literally have witnessed this for ourselves. I think that this is where we kind of disagree credit the things that come natural Mm -hmm. for us, the interests that we have, the passions that we have, the way that we see the world, you know, like there's so much discrediting and just, you know, not valuing what we come with. Like we just think that surely everyone else has something more valuable than what uh, what I have in me. Like I can't even tell you how many artists have told me that they don't have anything special. Honestly, and, and, and they say it with all sincerity. And I'm like, yes, you do. 100% you yeah. do. And yeah. it's just, again, digging into it and finding a way. Because the other option is to live a, I, I hate to say fake, but for me, it felt like a fake world, you know, where mm. these walls were up. It was like this this glass box that I lived in that had Mm -hmm. to be a certain way and had to look a certain way. And the reality is no one who really knew me bought the glass box anyway. (laughs) You know, they're like, that's not, that's not really you anyway. You're, this is how you really are. And so to um, be able to be really relaxed about that, you know, it doesn't mean that people don't judge you. You know, I think that it, it, it's an illusion to think like, oh, if I just get this or if I do this, then maybe, you know, I won't get judged. My mother-in-law still questions whether my painting should be sellable. Like she's like, do people <laughs> do people pay for that? I'm like, really? Yeah. Buy that? yeah. <laughs> so I think that you know, it doesn't matter to me anymore. You know, I think mm-hmm. where if she would have said that, you know, back when I wasn't really convinced at what I was doing, then I would have yeah. probably like had a, you know, stab in the stomach. But when I hear things like that now, I think. Yeah, they do pay for it, actually. Thanks for asking. 